And uh, we're going to start right in with Cesar Rodriguez Sanoa. Uh, and this is a, a ARDP project, and he's with Rutgers University. And the title of his talk is Managing an Invasive Drosophilid Species in Agriculture Using Innovative Behavioral Manipulation Strategies. So, Cesar, go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. So, spotted wind drosophila is an invasive pest uh, from Asia. Uh, it invaded the continental USA in 2008. And since then, it has uh, uh, invaded most of the states in uh, the USA. And also, it has been found now in Europe, uh, many countries in Europe, and also more recently in uh, South America. Um, this insect is a pest of uh, soft, uh, thin skin uh, fruits, including blueberries, raspberries, strawberries, and cherries. And, and like other uh, Drosophila uh, flies that lay eggs on rotten fruit, uh, females of this species have uh, this uh, serrated ovipositor that allows them to oviposit in uh, ripening fruit. And uh, current methods to control this pest uh, rely uh, mainly on chemical control. So alternative control methods uh, are much needed. Um, so in the past four or five years, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Tracy Lesky from the US, USDA ARS, we have been looking at the possibility of using uh, red attractile spheres um, that combine a visual stimuli, a stimulus with an insecticide uh, for managing spotted wind drosophila. So these, uh, these spheres uh, were developed by uh, Ron Procopy uh, for the control of apple maggot flies and the top of the sphere, uh, the, the, the cap, uh, is made of wax and it has also um, a mix of uh, red dye with an insecticide and a sugar as a bagger stimulant. So when it rains um, or under high humidity, uh, the red sphere, the entire red sphere is coated with uh, the insecticide and the sugar. So next slide, please. So, um, uh, one of the first things that uh, we did uh, for this project uh, was to look at the, um, the efficacy, uh, the, uh, the mortality of the, the flies, um, um, the use of different insecticides uh, with these spheres um, at different rates, and the mortality of the flies uh, when exposed to these different insecticides after 48 hours. And as you can see uh, in the graph on your uh, left top corner, uh, you can see that uh, most insecticides were toxic at 1% active ingredient. So that's the, the, uh, the rate that we're using uh, in our studies, current studies. Uh, so uh, after that, we did a, a small scale uh, field experiment uh, using potted raspberries uh, with a ripe fruit. And we tested a weekly sprays of insecticides, 1% uh, 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 delegate uh, spheres in 2013 and 1% venom spheres in 2014. Uh, we compare that with uh, a combination of the sprays with the spheres and a control treatment. And um, after um, the treatments, uh, ripe berries were harvested and evaluated for infestation. And we found that in both years, um, uh, the spheres reduced infestation of spotted wing in uh, fruits. And in one year, um, it was as effective as the weekly insecticide sprays. Um, so uh, after that, we also conducted uh, studies to determine the position of the sphere, whether it matters where you place them. And in this case, we had a fruit that was coated with tangle food and placed at different heights um, within raspberry plants. Uh, we placed five berries uh, per level and we released about 120 adults within these cages. And we found that most uh, flies were captured in the lower parts of the plant, as you can see in the graph in the top right corner. Um, and similar studies were done in a small field plots. Uh, in the field, more flies, again, were captured when fruits were placed in the lower parts of the plants and also um, higher numbers uh, of flies were captured along the edges of the field than uh, the center of the fields. And that's in the bottom right corner, that graph that you see. Uh, so next. 
So in uh, 2016, uh, we conducted a study um, in a larger scale, um, a larger scale study in a, a blueberry uh, farm to test the efficacy of the atraxicidal spheres in reducing larval infestation in fruit. Uh, we tested uh, two arrangements. So we did um, a grid pattern where every other uh, bush received a sphere throughout the field and a perimeter pattern uh, where only the first rows within the field uh, received uh, a sphere. And we found uh, a reduction in a spotted wind drosophila larval infestation under both arrangements as compared to the no treatment control. And uh, we continued uh, doing these studies this year. Uh, we uh, replicated this study uh, in 2016 and also we did a study where we looked at whether placing the spheres in the lower part of the bush or the upper part of the bush matters. So in conclusion, we are finding that the tracticidal spheres uh, show promise in reducing fruit infestation. Um, spotted wind drosophila prefers the lower parts of the canopy um, and uh, higher infestation is found along the field edges. And again, we're finding that uh, both grid and perimeter uh, deployments are, are seem to be effective. Great, thank you, Cesar. This is really good. Um, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more about this. We're going to move on to Ann Nielsen, who uh, has an ARDP project, and she is also with Rutgers University. The title of her talk is IPM CPR using border sprays for brown marmorated sting bug in fruit. So, Ann, go ahead. All right, thank you. So, uh, this is a collaborative project between uh, Rutgers and University of Georgia. Uh, or at least my postdoc who moved to the University of Georgia at USDA and Virginia Tech. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. So as, as Peter's already mentioned, thank you for the introduction there, Peter. Um, brown marmorated stink bug has had system, systems level impacts on, the or on orchard systems since its introduction. Um, because it is a season long pest and multiple life stages can cause damage throughout the growing season, it causes repeated in, um, applications of broad spectrum insecticides. Um, in the years since its major outbreak, our growers have in the mid-Atlantic region have dropped our primary uh, IPM tactics such as mating disruption and incidence-based management using treatment thresholds. And because we're using uh, primarily pyrethroids, we are also, it's, this has resulted in secondary pest outbreaks, um, specifically San Jose scale, phytophagous mites, um, white peach scale and woolly apple aphid. Next slide. So what we've developed in my lab beginning in 2012 is what we term IPM CPR because we're trying to resuscitate IPM programs in tree fruit. Uh, it's a little tongue in cheek, but it's fun. Um, so this stands for crop perimeter restructuring. So we've done some um, work in the field using protein markers where we identified that um, the majority of brown marmorated stink bug adults stop and arrest their, their, their movement into the orchard at the border edge. And this behavior persists, these bugs persist at the border for about seven days. The bugs that do move and continue to move into the interior of the orchard are the females, which of course are doing that to presumably lay eggs. And we really want to stop that behavior. So the idea of our border spray tactic is to reintroduce mating disruption for our lepidopterous pests, our worms in the apple or, or peach, to utilize ground cover management, uh, which is a herbicide application that reduces flowering weeds, specifically white clover, in the row middles to reduce ligus, our tarnished plant bug populations, as well as our native stink bugs. And our, the new proposal will also be look, also looks at the impact that this might have on foraging bees within the orchard um, post bloom. So this incorporates the border sprays, which in the, the blue area in the, in the figure is the area that's sprayed. So we compared our border spray tactic, which only sprays about 25% of the orchard to a grower standard. Now, all of this research is being done on commercial farms um, in a minimum of five acre blocks and the growers are making the insecticide applications. So we've compared this um, in peach for multiple years and apples as well. Next slide. Oh, sorry, that's supposed to be animated. Okay, so um, in, we've, we've done this 2012, 2013, 2014 in five acre blocks of the same variety on the same farms. And what we see, although you can't see it all, is a, um, 
equal, if not significantly less amounts of injury in our IPM CPR or border spray tactics compared to our grower standard. This was true for our cat-faced injury, which is stink bug injury, and we also saw benefits to oriental fruit moth as well as tarnished plant bug or early season cat-facing injury. So we know that this tactic works at a five-acre field in New under New Jersey conditions. Next slide, please. So what we were trying to do is we've expanded this project to West Virginia and Virginia. Um, we were not able to do this in 2016 because of a freeze. Um, so we did this in 2017 in Peach. In New Jersey, what we did is we wanted, our growers wanted to see how big we could go. So we've done this at the five acre, 10 acre and 20 acre level. Um, what we're seeing so far is that it looks like 10 acres is about as big as we can go. Um, but at five acres, we're only spraying 25% of the orchard. Um, so we're presuming that this will decrease um, the, at 10 acres as well. So this is looking very promising. Um, next slide. Um, but what's really important to me is that we're seeing a systems level impact. So we're seeing um, a benefit to the natural enemy community um, in terms of abundance and effect on our natural enemy species um, in, in peaches. And then with the herbicide treatment, uh, we're also seeing a benefit to the reduction, reducing the number of foraging bees within the orchard post bloom, which um, we're hoping will provide some protection from them against the insecticides and fungicides that are sprayed throughout the growing season. Next slide. And also makes it compatible with uh, you know, the new bee labels. What's really exciting and important is that uh, this year, whoops, it's okay, stay there. Um, this year we saw uh, Trisulcus japonicus, which is the primary egg parasitoid of brown marmorate stink bug. And we found this in three commercial orchards in New Jersey, and all of those were in our plots that were utilizing border sprays. Uh, so this does seem to be that it may be a compatible technique with um, IPM and biological control. We did this in apples in 2016 and 2017. Uh, we're still crunching the numbers for 2017. Um, but it looks like this technique can also work. Uh, we also incorporate the threshold here that uh, Peter mentioned, which was developed by Tracy Lesky's lab. Okay, next slide. So um, what, what we're hoping we can do is we can integrate some of our traditional IPM tools, as, as Steve mentioned earlier, all these IPM toolbox uh, tactics that we have. We can control our ground cover. We can help protect our pollinators and our beneficial insects, and we can reduce the amount of active ingredient that is utilized in our orchards um, to create a more sustainable systems level approach. Um, the one downside is that in apples, we did not see as good of a benefit in the first year to our natural enemy community, but we're hoping that um, multiple years will we'll show some effect. So. Great, thanks, Anne. That's really important, uh, and I like the humor. We always need that IPM CPR. That's wonderful. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to move along here uh, to Kathy Murray, and she is from the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry, and her presentation is um, on engaging school nurses to promote school IPM, and this is through the Northeastern IPM Center. So, Kathy, go ahead. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, this is a project, a two-year grant, a communications project grant um, put forth by the Northeastern School IPM Working Group. The IPM Working Group started with funding from the Northeast IPM Center 10 years ago, and we've been going for 10 years, uh, and we don't have uh, funding through the center anymore other than through these periodic grants. Uh, the group is uh, representatives from each of the Northeastern states. Uh, we meet bi-monthly by conference call and then periodically uh, engage together to do projects like this. Uh, so this particular project, um, the objectives are to develop a strategic communication plan, identifying best routes and contacts and messages that we can use to help school nurses to better understand and lead adoption of integrated pest management in schools. Uh, to provide some training for school nurses throughout the Northeastern region, and to develop and distribute some outreach materials that will direct school nurses to those resources. Uh, the anticipated outcomes of this project is that school nurses will learn how to access the information that they need to be able to recognize health at impacting pests and pest-friendly conditions, and to be empowered to promote and support IPM uh, and effective IPM strategies in their schools. As probably many people know, um, schools are just like any other uh, sets of buildings and landscapes and um, turf, and, and they periodically have pest issues and pesticide exposure incidents. There's been a number of 
notable instances where kids and staff have been either unintentionally exposed to pesticides or have had pest issues, sometimes resulting in the schools closing. And in response to that, or even not in response to that, um, many states have implemented uh, restrictions on how pesticides can be used. And some of the states, mine included in Maine, uh, New York, is other Connecticut, Massachusetts, many states require that schools have specific requirements for implementing integrated pest management. But as many of us understand, you can you know, provide all the information you want um, to a user, but getting them to actually change their behavior sometimes uh, requires what we call a change agent, you know, someone who is influential. And we figured that school nurses uh, really could fit the bill that way. They're trained in science, they're trained observers, they're listened to, they're a, a respected member of their community and in their schools, and they seem to be quite receptive to the message too. Um, so we've initiated this project. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, with a, uh, a, a survey, uh, we had to establish contacts with uh, school nurse associations and the National School Nurse Association has uh, been supportive of this project um, too, to contact school nurses throughout all the northeastern states. And we got 827 school nurses uh, participating from 10 states, not quite all of them. Uh, the full report is posted on my website, which is maine.gov slash school IPM. But here's just a couple of the results. We asked, um, how do you view pest risk concerns in your schools to identify what what they thought were the biggest problems for them. Uh, ticks and mosquitoes, not surprisingly, kind of topped the list. A little surprisingly to us is that they don't seem to understand the risks associated with uh, mice in infestations and that it's been pretty well established that mice do occur in schools and that um, asthma allergens associated with mouse urine in schools uh, has been shown to uh, increase the risk of asthma in schools. And I don't think school nurses seem to be as cognizant as, of that as, as we think they uh, should. But uh, we also asked, uh, how effective do you think your school's prevention and response protocols are? And that was kind of the mirror image that for those ticks and mosquitoes, um, bed bugs, they're not quite certain that their schools are responding in the best way um, they could. But there again, they think that um, school's doing a pretty good job with mice. Um, we asked them, uh, how would they best like to be able to get information? 60% of them said that they would get information from websites. 50% uh, said they would take um, advantage of self-paced learning modules. 45% said they would participate in a one-hour webinar. And a quarter of them said that they would um, participate in a training if it was offered at a conference. Can you go to the next slide, please. So what we've accomplished to date so far is we have established those collaboration and communications with uh, school nurses associations in most of the Northeastern states and as well as the national. Uh, we've conducted that survey. Uh, we've developed some presentations and exhibits have gone to the regional and um, uh, one state school nurse uh, conference. I just went a couple of weekends ago to the one here in Maine. Uh, we've submitted abstracts to give presentations to offer training and information at the National School Nursing Association Conference in 2018. We have started uh, to develop some resources because they identified ticks and mosquitoes as being really important. Uh, we collected some ticks, embedded them in, in acrylic, put a label on them so they could help them to identify the difference between deer ticks and dog ticks. And then we've developed a tick removal spoon that has a website um, on it, uh, stopschoolpests.org. This is in collaboration with some other groups around the uh, country, school, IPM groups. And we have developed this website called stopschoolpests.org, which has these uh, pre-developed modules for training school nurses. And our, our plan is to adapt those for the Northeast and, and use those. So I think that's um, about our update great. from now. Great, thanks. Thanks, Kathy. That's great. Uh, I think your statistic about 60% of nurses getting their information from the web, web the internet is really telling. Uh, and it really speaks to a lot of what we do. And I'm, I'm happy to see you have those findings. And also, again, the, the addressing behavior change. Um, I, we're hearing that as, throughout this morning and perhaps the rest of the talks, but really appreciate that. We're going to move along to our final talk for this uh, half hour. And this will be um, Andrean Gorney, and she is with the uh, Cornell University. And this is a Northeast Stair project looking at susceptibility of potato varieties grown in New York to root knot nematode. So Andrean, go ahead. Great, thank you. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, right, so I'm a graduate student and I'm working with Dr. Sarah Pethybridge. 
and our lab does a lot of uh, quantitative epidemiology, um, and I specifically work on the northern root of nematode Meloidogyne hapla. And um, this work is part of a Northeast SARE project, um, which is actually sort of wrapping up right now, but I uh, thought I'd share with you some things. Um, so next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so the whole uh, goal of my project is to support informed nematode management decisions. So um, informing when a grower may um, apply a management decision for root knot populations in his field. And by doing this, by correlating the pre-plant nematode population densities with crop loss. So it's well understood that um, crop loss is a direct factor of the nematodes in the soil prior to planting. And particularly, what is the economic threshold for um, the northern root knot nematode? So specific project goals were to quantify the crop loss and identify uh, economically important thresholds and finally visualize nematode distribution in the field. Um, so if you were at this conference last year, uh, you heard me talk a little bit about the, the visualization part, um, but this time I'd wanna talk about the quantification and identifying these thresholds. And to do that, um, next slide please. Um, I conducted a greenhouse pot trial um, to uh, look at the differential responses of several different potato cultivars to infection by the northern root knot nematode. And within this, I was evaluating plant growth um, and yield with the goal of trying to inform these thresholds. And uh, I grew the plants for uh, nine weeks, after which I collected data on shoot mass, root mass, tuber yield, um, the number of tubers formed, the diameter of each one, um, the root galling index, which was just a scale of zero to 100% on how um, severely damaged the roots were. And finally, the nematode reproduction factor, which is simply a ratio of the final population measured in the number of uh, J2 stage nematodes plus the number of eggs all over the initial population, um, which I had inoculated. And this gives an indication of how well uh, that particular cultivar is at supporting the nematode population. So next slide, please. Um, so pretty basic uh, experimental design here. I had um, a gallon and a half plastic pots filled with pasteurized soil. And into each, I planted one uh, potato tuber and inoculated it with a set amount of um, infectious second stage juvenile uh, M. hapla nematodes. And I had three different inoculation levels. So I had um, a control group with zero nematodes. Um, a group with 500 nematodes per pot, which I'm calling medium, and finally a group with 1,500 nematodes per pot, which I was calling high. So I had um, five replicates of each of those groups, and I had 11 different potato cultivars in total, which you can see listed at the bottom of the slide there. Uh, I also included a tomato control. Um, this was a positive control of a a variety of tomato that we know to be susceptible to uh, northern root knot nematode. Um, so like I said, after the nine weeks, I collected a lot of data, which I'm actually currently in the process of analyzing. So unfortunately, I don't have many results to, to share with you folks today. Um, although preliminarily, it does look like there um, are small differences in yield um, between the inoculation groups and also in nematode reproduction factor. However, um, I'm not seeing too many uh, differences in the other data points that I collected. Um, yeah, so I'd, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, so that's interesting. And I was, you know, I guess maybe you could put this into the IPM you know, perspective is, how do you see that or what you're doing is fitting into that um, kind of uh, approach? Can you elaborate on that maybe? Yes, excellent. So um, what we're finding here in New York is that a lot of um, potato growers are um, 
prophylactically treating their fields for nematodes without much knowledge of the populations in their field to begin with. And if we can um, determine a threshold at which um, above the threshold, um, growers may need to take action, or if their fields are below the threshold, they may forego um, applying a, a nematicide. Um, it could save a lot of money and it could save uh, up the application. Great, uh, and I've talked to um, some folks about, there's also beneficial nematodes, right? So, so even targeting where specific nematode populations are in the soil is something that is being looked at. Is that something that you guys are doing as well? Um, not particularly our lab, but definitely that is something, uh, a, a good area of research, yes. Okay. Great, well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. So we've got about five minutes here and I see the chat um, box has been active and that's great. Really some good interactions there. And, and I would- uh, Charles Lubelchik had a question for Peter Yen. So. Okay. Yes, I was wondering um, why marmorated stink bugs tend to hang near edge. Is it a question of microclimate or humidity or predation? Peter, or maybe Ann, are they unmuted, Yana? Yes, uh, Peter is, and let me unmute Ann. Um, it looks like maybe Peter has stepped away, and Ann has too. So, so we will have to get an answer to that question later. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, P, uh, Charles, I was, uh, I've seen some work on the margin, you know, what attracts brown marmory stink bugs in the margins. And I think there's some work actually that Tree of Heaven is one of the uh, most likely kind of um, vegetation forms that it likes to hang out on besides the actual fruit that it seems to cause damage to. And I, I know that Anne or Peter or some, many others could probably speak to that, but it's, it's, you know, it's moving in and out is really interesting. And I would say, is there a comparison with what ticks do? I mean, do they, yeah. I mean, obviously they don't hang out on vegetation so much, at least from what I know, but is there, you know, do they, is that something that you guys see with your work and what you know on the tick populations? Yeah, with ticks, they tend to like a very humid uh, microclimate and okay. also um, with protection from sun and wind. And so with the proximity to edge or forest habitat, they don't go very far from uh, forest edge. So that would mean that, you know, they're, they're very protected once you get to a shrub layer. So that translates into, into a lot of activity near the edge habitat. Right. And the other thing that just on your, what you guys are doing, you know, I've seen recently there's been a increasing or maybe they're not increasing, but the interest in deer populations and a lot of folks have been working on deer and invasive plants and kind of how that yeah. habitat's being disruptive. But I know the ticks are part of that system, you know, so there's this tick deer vegetation kind of, um, uh, you know, interaction going on. And then us humans, you know, we're part of that because then we're exposed to ticks and we like yeah. to say, well, there's too many deer and they're, you know, bringing all the ticks in. And I know that's <laughs> going a lot into that, but yeah. um, there's a connection there as what I'm trying to say, I guess. I, I think so. Yeah. I think that, you know, there's a lot of work done about 20 years ago, looking at deer as a keystone herbivore. And I think that, that a lot of people maybe forget that. And so I think that, yeah, that there is an importance to that, but it's one deer and habitat are all separate components. And with a lot of this is integrated, you know, there's not one silver bullet that's causing the problem, I think. So. Mm -hmm. I think for BMSB, what is important is uh, resource availability, like what's available to them. So I think once they move from outside to a field, um, Anne is actually doing a, uh, a, a mark recapture study where she's finding that males tend to just aggregate along the field edges. So I, once they, they uh, colonize the field, they stop there and because there's mm. food, okay. whereas females tend to like migrate, move a little bit further. And I mm -hmm. think it's just because they are looking for places to have a positive. Yep. Um, okay. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and I'm, he I'm hearing this behavior thing again. So, Let's, uh, let's stay with that theme. We're going to move into our next talk here.